for um, NCCER number 103-09. It has to do with the identification of hand tools. Uh, our objective here today is to uh, give you some idea of the identification of different types of hand tools. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about the usage of these tools, talk a little bit about the safety uh, of all of these tools. Now, the, uh, there will be a test over this, and I do expect you all to take uh, good notes, and I will be taking those up to look at them as a quiz grade. Um, beyond that, I guess we'll just step right into this and, and move forward. Okay, now, our first slide is talking about a tool belt. Now, everyone knows that this is the tool belt, okay? The point of this slide is not really to, to help you identify a tool belt. It's for me to tell you this. When you have a job, you're expected to be ready when you're at that job. You're expected to have your tool belt on at all times. You're expected to have your mind focused on your job, and you're expected to work hard while you're there. Uh, we wouldn't expect a doctor to come in and not have a stethoscope and not have a thermometer and not have the things that he or she needs to do their job, and we're not expected to do that either. If we're carpenters, engineers, uh, if you're working at McDonald's right now, you are expected to be ready and to do your job with pride and uh, to be ready. So that, that's kind of the point of that slide. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Okay, this is a wood chisel. Um, okay. This is a tool that has a beveled edge on it. Um, it's designed to cut or shape wood. Uh, you never ever want to point this chisel to you. Um, the idea is that you would hold this against the wood happen with a hammer. It should be a good sharp chisel so that you don't have to hit it very hard. If it's dull and you're having to hit it too hard, we need to sharpen it, okay? Um, again, the main thing is, is we don't want to point this towards us and we don't want to try to stab at the wood to cut it, okay? You tap it with a hammer. That's the proper way to use this tool. Okay. Now, many many types of chisels have a wood, I'm sorry, a metal end on them. And if that end ever becomes mushroomed, then the chisel needs to be repaired. This is an example of a metal chisel here. It's a cold chisel, but if this were to become uh, damaged, then we would need to repair it. Um, similarly. This tool, uh, the, the end can also become damaged, even though it's it's not a fully metal chisel. It does have some plastic on it for a grip. That can become damaged, and it does. You're probably going to have to throw this one away. Uh, again, if we keep them sharp, we shouldn't have to hit them hard enough to damage them. <clears throat> okay, this is a flat file. Uh, I have one of these here that I'll show you. The one I have here is actually a wood rasp on one side, and we'll see a slide on the wood rasp here in just a moment. The other side is a flat file. The wood rasp is much rougher. Both are used to uh, shape wood. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the rasp is used to shape wood. The file is used to shape metal. Um, and right here, this, pic this is a picture of a file card. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, I don't have one of these, 
but it's used to remove any uh, shed, any filings from the file so it doesn't become clogged and, and get rid of it. Um, so we wanna, I want you to pay special attention to that. Again, this is a wood rasp and it is uh, is similar to a, uh, a file, but it's used for wood. Okay, this is a compass saw. Now, I don't have a compass saw. Um, but you do need to know that it's used for cutting irregular shapes in wood. Sometimes it can be used to cut sheetrock. Um, in a situation where you've got to cut a hole for, for a pipe that's coming through the wall, you might use a, a compass saw to cut that hole. Um, okay, a coping saw. Coping saws are used primarily uh, in running trim, baseboard, uh, crown mold, things of that nature. And you can cut all kinds of shapes with these. Uh, it's a pretty versatile tool. It's a coping saw. Okay. <clears throat> now, there's two different types of hand saws. Um, when you're using either one, make sure that when you uh, are cutting and you make that last stroke, the stroke that causes the board to fall onto the ground, make sure you've braced yourself properly because you could be thrown off balance and you could fall and it could be dangerous. Um, we want to keep our hands away from the teeth. They're sharp and they can cut you. Uh, this one here is a cross cut saw. And we know from our safety lessons that a crosscut saw is used to cut across the grain. This saw is a rip saw uh, and it's used to cut with the grain. Now, this next two slides is going to let us know the difference in these. Okay, these are the teeth for a crosscut saw, and you can tell that the teeth are flared out a lot. The teeth on a rip saw are not flared out as much. They're flared out a little bit, but not nearly as much. Okay, so that's that's the difference between a rip saw and a crosscut saw. Um, also, these saws are designated with points, uh, meaning that's uh, the the points that a saw is is the amount of teeth per inch. So an eight point saw would have eight teeth per inch. Okay. All right, this is a hacksaw, and this is used for cutting metal. Uh, it, a lot of people, when they're, they're young and they're kids and they're building a playhouse or whatever, they may come upon one of these and try to cut lumber with it. It takes 40 forevers to cut just a two by four with this thing. So uh, make sure that we use that for metal and not for wood. Okay, a chuck key. A chuck key, obviously it looks like this, and I've got one here. And what a chuck key is used for, it's used to take a drill bit in or out of an electric drill with a, uh, this type of chuck on it. And you insert the stud into the hole, the teeth interlock, and you turn it, and that will cause the calipers to rotate in or out, and that squeezes on the drill bit. Uh, cat's claw. Okay. Here's a cat's claw, and cat's claws are used to remove nails. Um, anytime you pull a nail, Make sure that the material uh, that is nailed and that you're pulling the nail out of is braced securely. Uh, you wouldn't want to lose your balance and fall because you didn't have something braced securely. 
But the idea with this is that you would take and you would drive these little teeth under the nail with a hammer and then you could pry the nail up and that would let you get up under it enough with the hammer that you could pull it out. Okay, uh, a 16 penny nail, uh, we use these very commonly in our class uh, and it's used for fastening structures together. This is something that gives a building its strength, okay? Um, this, you'd be nailing two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, two by tens, or two by twelves in, normally with a 16 penny nail. Um, if you have to nail on plywood, OSB, what we call sheet goods, um, you'd use an eight penny nail. That, that D on there, that stands for penny. So uh, you should all know that by now. This is very common in our shop. Um, now there's two types, there's another type of nail and it's a finished nail and it just has a little tiny head on it. And the idea with this is that it's used to install trim, ground mold, baseboard, window casing, things of that nature. And that tiny head on the nail is meant to be recessed below the surface of the nail so that putty can be put in that hole that's left and it painted over and you never see it. Uh, so that's kind of the point of a trim nail. Roofing nail, they're usually an inch and a quarter long and they're used to install shingles. A button cap, a button cap's just a, a regular little nail and it's got a little plastic ring on it, for lack of a better word. Uh, a lot of times these are used to put roofing, roofing felt on, which roofing felt is a, a, a barrier that goes between the plywood or OSB that's on the roof and the shingles and it, it just helps to keep building dry until shingles can be installed and it also uh, is a separation between the shingles and the, uh, the wood because sometimes those chemicals can interact and cause the shingles to break down. Uh, so it's used for that and it's also used to install house wrap. Uh, some of you may have seen houses that look like they just have paper wrapped around them. That's house wrap and it's a, a vapor barrier and also moisture, but mainly vapor, uh, just to help keep the house warm uh, in the winter time. So that's what those are used for. Okay, we've got a good old caulking gun here. Very simple. Now this one has a little hole right here, and it's pretty common that you can stick your caulking uh, tube in there and squeeze it, and it'll cut the end of it off so you can get the caulk out of there. This one also has a little, uh, metal stud sticking out and you take that and you jam it into the caulking tube to break the seal on it. So this is kind of a pretty good caulking gun here. These have a little glass vial in it with a bubble, and once that bubble is in the middle of that glass vial, then this is level, okay? Now, remember, if it's level, it's horizontal. If it's vertical, this is plumb, okay? That's the terminology. Level is horizontal, vertical is plumb. Okay, a torpedo level. This is very similar to a two foot or a four foot level. Uh, the advantage is that this is small and it can be carried in a, uh, in a nail apron. Uh, it has a magnet on the side as well. So if you're working with metal studs or any other type of metal uh, building material, you can just stick this to the side of it and it will hold itself. You don't have to hold it up there. Okay. A framing square. This is a framing square. 
the, the main thing about a frame of square is it's a tool that is used to measure rise and run at the same time. I know most of you talk about rise and run in your uh, math classes. So this, this is a tool that measures both of them at the same time. Uh, in the construction industry, we use this primarily for rafters, which is the structure of a roof, or it'll, it's also used for laying out stair stringers. Now, there's lots and lots of other uses for it. Um, this thing can be used to tell the distance across a, uh, a river, even. So it's a very useful tool, um, but primarily it has those two uh, uses in our class, anyways. Framing square. Okay, here's the speed square. It's a square that's shaped like a triangle. Um, it's got a lot of uses. Uh, a lot of times we use this thing to uh, just mark a square line across the board, but you can mark angles, hips and valleys, common rafters, lots of things. And uh, most, of the most of the time in this class we'll be marking angles with it. Uh, if you come back for carpentry too, we'll use that for some other things that are a little more intense. Okay, here's a nut driver, and it's similar to a socket, but it's like it's shaped like a screwdriver. So you could put this on a nut or a bolt and just twist it. These are used uh, pretty commonly by electricians. Uh, so, nut driver. Okay, this is an auger bit, <clears throat> and I don't have an auger bit, but an auger bit is designed to use when you're drilling a large quantity of holes. You can see right here that there's a little spur on the end of this thing, and what happens is you put it in a drill, and then you press that spur into the wood, and the spur begins to thread, and it will actually pull this bit right through a board. Uh, so you don't have to press at all. Just lets the drill motor do all the work. So it's pretty pretty easy. These are commonly used by electricians because when electricians put wire in a house, they have to drill a lot of holes. So this kind of helps them to do their job more quickly and easily. Chalk box. Here's my chalk box. Okay, um, and and to use the chalk box, you. It's used to transfer a straight line to a, a surface. Uh, you, you take the line and, and you pull it out of here and you just stretch it on your plywood or whatever you're cutting and then you raise it and smack it and it will transfer the line to that uh, surface, whatever it is. <laughs> okay, here's a spade bit or also called a paddle bit. Um, you can see it's got a little spur here on the end. And anytime you're drilling, you don't ever want to, to, to reach under that board to try to see if this spur has come out because it can cut you, it's sharp. So be careful with these. Um, make sure they're uh, fastened securely, securely in the drill. Uh, these are real common. We use these a lot in, in my class. Okay, this is a metal bit, also called a twist bit. Um, these are probably the most common. I think everybody has seen these at some point or another. Um, here's a, an example of it, and it's just used to drill holes. Um, I kind of prefer the paddle bits just because they're easy to locate. Now this is a Forstner bit. I don't have a, uh, a slide on this one. But this is also used to drill holes when you want a flat bottom on it. Okay, a utility knife. Now a lot of folks in my class want to call these box cutters. And my answer to that is when you're sacking groceries at food, I'm sorry, when you're stocking shelves at a grocery store and you're cutting boxes with this every day, call it a box cutter by all means. But it's very rare that we're going to cut a box with this knife, okay? So in my class, it, 
I encourage you to call this a utility knot. That's what it's called in the industry. Uh, now there's several different types of these. This one, you can push it out and let it go and the blade stays out right there. Um, now there's one type as well that's sort of spring loaded so that you have to hold that blade out and when you let your finger off it would immediately come right back in. And those are really the most safe types of these. Um, but we use these for the most part in class. <clears throat> and if you're using one of these, don't forget that to put a piece of scrap under whatever you're cutting so that you don't damage the surface that's beneath it. There's another slide that just echoes what I just said. Okay, these are vice grips. Okay, um, vice grips are designed to squeeze and hold a bolt. It's got a little um, threaded knob here that allows us to tighten it up. And what we do is we get it about right, and then we can push it down and it will hold that, see? So that's what a vice grip is. It's a pretty useful tool to have around. You don't need it every day, but when you need it, you really need it. Okay, this is a bar clamp. <clears throat> and what you do is you just take this and you put it on whatever you're trying to clamp and you press the bottom up until it's fairly tight and then you can put a little bit more pressure on it with that uh, screw knob that's on the top right there. So, bar clamp. Uh, this is a C clamp. Right here, here's a pretty large C clamp. Um, you know, it's pretty obvious how this works. The main thing I would say about this is don't clamp this thing down too hard because if, if you do, you can bend this frame. It's actually a lot easier to do than you would think. And once the, once the frame's bent, the clamp's ruined. So please don't over tighten these. Um, when, the, when the clamp's bent and it's ruined, you just got to throw it away. It's not good for anything anymore. All right, plumb bob. This is a plumb bob, and you can see it's just a, a pointed weight with a string through it. And what this is used for is if, if I had a point perhaps on the, on the ceiling there, and I needed to transfer that point um, down to the floor, or vice versa, sometimes you might want to mark something on the ground and transfer that mark up there. What I would do is just hold this and then I could get it to the point once it stops swinging and then just mark that point on the ground. Uh, it's pretty common, commonly used uh, in construction. Okay, I got two types of hammers here. <clears throat> I got a curved claw, and you can see by looking at the claws why it's called a curved claw hammer. And I've got a straight claw hammer. It's got straight claws on it. Uh, I prefer these. Uh, I'm sorry, I prefer the straight claw hammer. It's much easier to pull nails. Uh, this is just a much easier hammer to use than this one. Some people prefer these. Um, don't ever hit these hammers together if you just want to do this, because if you do, chunks of this hammer will actually fly off and they can cut you. And usually they won't bounce off your skin, they will go into your body and lodge in your, under your skin. And you have to have them surgically removed or you end up with nasty things like blood poisoning. So please don't bang them together, it is a big deal. There's a straight claw hammer. Okay. A miter box, this is not used uh, very commonly anymore. Uh, these were more um, before they had the, the compound miter saws that we do now, but I got this in here just so uh, if anyone ever asks you, and you, you'll know what a miter box looks like. She's for cutting trim. So you, you lay your trim in there and then this saw goes at an angle, you cut it that way. Nail set. 
here's a nail set. And if you'll remember just a moment ago when I was uh, talking about the trim nail and I told you that you have to recess the head of that trim nail below the surface of the trim so you can caulk it and paint over it. This okay, is where you drive your nail down to a point and then you use this and you tap that nail below the surface of the trim. Okay, here's some diagonal cutting pliers. Sometimes, many times these are called dikes. So if you're ever working with someone and they say, give me a pair of dikes, these, is what, these are what you want. They're used for cutting wire. Um, the, the cutting line is sort of diagonal. That's why they get the name. Here, these are side cutters. Sometimes these are called lineman's pliers. Uh, I call them that just because the person that introduced me to them, that's what he called them. I just picked them up. But they cut on the side of the plier. It's a heavy duty tool. It can be used to twist wire, cut wire. It's a pretty, pretty good tool right there. Okay, slip joint pliers. Uh, a lot of times these are called crescent wrenches. No, I'm sorry, channel locks. And the reason they're called channel locks is because that's the main manufacturer of them. And they're adjustable, so you can open them up and this thing slides down like that. You can get grip a small bolt or you can grip a, a really large bolt. Um, now, when you use these, always make sure that this is on top. So if I was turning a bolt to the right, right here, I want to do it like that. It will grip much harder than if I try to turn it over and grip it this way. Okay? If I'm loosening a bolt, again, I want to turn this, have this to the top and turn it like that. It's just it's the proper way to use it. So if you're ever using one of those, remember that. Okay, these are also called uh, these can also be called tongue and groove pliers. Um, I want you to remember that these types of things have a serrated teeth so they can grip flat, square, round, or hexagonal objects. Okay? Remember those serrated teeth on that. Phillips head screwdriver, star shaped. You can see right here. They're used for screws that have a cross-shaped head. Here's a standard. Um, it's flathead, called flathead also. Guys, remember that no matter what type of screwdriver you're using, this should never be used against live wires, uh, or near live wires rather. Uh, a lot of times electricians may have to work in a panel, uh, like we have in our classroom here, and it would be a wise, wise move to turn that panel off before you do any work in it. I wouldn't work in it. Otherwise, here's our crowbar right here. Anytime uh, you're using a crowbar, make sure you keep your feet balanced and have a, a just a firm base under you because if you're pulling on this and it comes loose all at once, if you don't have your feet set, you could fall over backwards. So remember that. The crowbar is used for demolition. We all know that. Okay, here's a, uh, an adjustable wrench. These are also called crescent wrenches. Again, because the main manufacturer uh, is called Crescent. That's what they've named them. Um, that's a, an eight inch adjustable wrench. Uh, it's used to tighten or loosen bolts. So, pretty common. Okay, we've got two types of wrenches. We've got an open-ended wrench and a closed-ended wrench. A closed wrench encircles the nut or bolt completely. An open-ended wrench leaves one end open. So when you're turning a bolt, you can use either one of these. Many times the open-ended is a little more convenient because it's easier to take off. But they both have their uses. All right, wire strippers. Here's some wire strippers. and. What these have, I don't know if you can see it here. I know you can see it on this PowerPoint. You see those little teeth right there? What those are designed to do is interlock and go around a piece of wire and cut the insulation that's on that wire 
so you can pull it off and it just leaves the bare wire. That way you can make a connection more easily. Here's another set of them. This, this has some other things on it where you can uh, cut bolts, but you know, there they are. Several different things on that one. Um, here is one, and I'm, there's several, there's a lot of different types of these, but these are for crimping or stripping wire. And it's, I'll put, you know, it's, it's got a little deal in there where if you have to put a stake on and connect two wires together, this lets you uh, crimp them together. Okay, that's a small cable cutter. It's just used for cutting wires, commonly used by electricians. Bunny cutters, this is used for cutting larger solid wire that may be too uh, dense to be cut with something smaller. It's a pipe wrench. I don't have one of these. We don't, we don't use them a lot in the shop, so I don't have one, but it's for turning larger objects. You can really get a lot of force on them. This for bending conduit. That's a conduit bender. So just remember what that looks like, and uh, it may come in handy someday. Hole cutter. I'm sorry. Hole saw. You can see this hole saw has got a round sort of a saw blade here, and in the middle it's got a regular drill bit, and it just spins and it'll cut out you know pretty good sized holes. We do use these some. Uh, when we're installing doorknobs, there's a meter called a wiggy meter. It's just a simple meter to see uh, if you've got a, a live circuit uh, in a receptacle or on between two wires. This is a unibit. A unibit can be used to drill several different types of holes. So. Um, Allen wrench. Or hey, Allen key set. Um, it's just got several different Allen wrenches. One, two, three, four, five. Six. There's seven different types of Allen wrenches in that uh, set there. All right, and a folding rule. I believe I have one here. I must have taken my folding rule out. Uh, but just remember that a folding rule is rigid, so it, it makes it easier to measure vertical distances with a, uh, a folding rule. So I have a, a tape measure here. Sometimes when I'm trying to measure a vertical distance, it will fall over. But a, uh, a folding rule doesn't have that problem. Oh, look here. Here's my folding. So right here, I can measure vertical distance and there's no problem with it falling over. Okay, shovels. Uh, there's different types of shovels. Um, some are round, some are pointed, some are short, some are long. Um, the square pointed shovels are used to uh, move large amounts of material. Um, they can't really be used to dig very well. Um, round bladed shovels are used to dig holes and they can be used to move large amounts of material. A pick. I don't know if any of y'all have ever used one of these, but this is hard, hard work when you break out a pick. I know it says shovels up there, but this is a pick. Uh, if you use one of these, make sure that this head, which is a large and heavy piece of metal, is attached to that, to the handle. Okay, here's a socket and a ratchet. This. This part is the socket, and this is the ratchet. The socket grips the nut or bolt, and the ratchet is used to turn it.
A torque wrench has a dial on it, and you can see the dial right here. And what happens is you use this wrench to tighten the nut or bolt to a certain degree of tightness. Uh, it's measured in foot pounds, uh, which is a, a measurement of torque or rotational force. Um, if you're using one of these, always keep one hand on the head of this torque wrench. This is a two-handed tool. 